Hello and welcome to Davos and to this special debate brought to you in cooperation with the World Economic Forum. In this session, we're debating a topic that goes straight to the heart of Europe's ability to compete. Whether you like it or not, Europe's fortunes are closely linked to those of its banks. And even though things seem to be improving in the European banking sector, there are signs that all is not well. Bank lending to businesses has been shrinking and some companies say it's hurting their growth. All the while, Europe is trying to build a banking union, but will that be a help or a hindrance? And to debate how European banks are actually doing and the European Banking Union, we have an all-star cast with us. From your right, Wolfgang Schäuble, who is the German finance minister. Uli Rehn, the European Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs. Federico Gizzoni, the chief executive of Unicredit, Italy's biggest bank by assets. Jeroen Dijsselbloem is the Dutch finance minister head of the Eurogroup, the now 18 countries that make up the Eurozone. Anne Shu Jain is the co-chief executive officer of Deutsche Bank, Germany's biggest uh, lender. And uh, last but not least, Lord Adair Turner, senior fellow at the Institute of New Economic Thinking in the UK. He was also chairman of the Financial Services Authority. I want to start by taking a look at the, the status quo in the European banking sector. There is a general consensus, uh, I think, in the analyst community that the European banking sector is doing a lot better now than it was a few years ago. Still, though, I want to gauge your mood of where the European banking sector is. And uh, if I can first get to your thoughts on that, Anshu Jain. Well, I think um, we need to take a step back, only because it's impossible to discuss where we are today without paying some heed to the fact that a mere 18 months ago, uh, the probability of Italian default was at 40%. Um, the world was stepping away from funding European banks. Cost of equity for European banks was spiraling. Cost of debt likewise. And there was widespread talk about a possible failure of the Eurozone. So we've come an enormous distance in a very short period of time. And frankly, we, we first have to begin by paying a real tribute to France and Germany, whose leadership, um, the ECB, the finance ministers, the central bank governors, uh, where, frankly, it took a lot of audacity, skill, and real discipline to get us to where we are now. So tail risk has now been taken away. Uh, so from a macro standpoint, there isn't much debate anymore. But? Is there a but? There is a but. Um, so yes, the sovereign picture looks a lot better. As you correctly pointed out, unfortunately, unemployment has actually spiraled. Bank lending is down. <coughs> Uh, European banks are in much better shape today than they were even a year ago. And I don't say that uh, subjectively. The numbers tell the story. Cost of equity down. CDS clearly telling you a story. Capital up. Liquidity up. The banking sector is in better shape. Nonetheless, a lot remains to be done. Uh, and I think the preconditions are now being put in place. Uh, the single supervisory mechanism is a step in the right direction. The asset quality review, which is about to come, um, and we don't know the full details yet, I think is going, to be, is, is, is going to be a huge step forward in terms of establishing transparency and creating trust. But we still aren't where we should be. Three quarters of credit formation in Europe happens via banks, not capital markets. And the banks are not in a position to create capital at the pace where they were. I'll pause here because I know there's more to Exactly. Discuss. We're going to come back to those uh, issues for sure, both the stress test by the European Central Bank and the, 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 the construction of a European banking union. Let, let's get the view from, from Italy and from uh, Unicredit. Federico Ghezzoni, what, what do you make of the, the health of the banking sector? I tend uh, to agree with um, Ansho about uh, the general picture. Um, if we look at um, Italy, I would say that uh, overall as well, uh, we have a uh, healthier banking sector because also in Italy we have seen uh, capital ratios going up. We have seen uh, the liquidity improving uh, significantly. We have seen uh, the leverage it is already a very low uh, level and so forth. What are the negative uh, side or the problem to, to be addressed uh, now? Are, I would say we have a problem of uh, quality of the asset because uh, it's obvious that due to the recession, the quality of the asset has been deteriorating. Um, and so there is indirectly maybe an issue of improving coverage. And uh, what is for me the real challenge for the Italian banking sector is to recover profitability. 
because uh, you can um, you can manage. Uh, I think the balance sheet right now, because the, the capital is good, uh, but looking forward, restoring profitability is indispensable in order to create capital and to be in the position then to uh, support the development of the economy through uh, lending. So I hope that uh, for Italian banks, uh, asset quality review will be really an opportunity to fix what is left. We have seen yesterday an interesting move, a mid-sized bank that is moving uh, under the um, uh, European supervision has decided for a quite significant right issue uh, and uh, quite significant increase of coverage in the last uh, quarter. Yes, this is the way to go. Uh, so I think that the system is prepared to go through this uh, difficult but uh, positive exercise that is the asset quality review. Uh, Commissioner Wren, I suppose you have uh, the, the, the European perspective. What's your take of where the European banking sector is, is heading? I think it's uh, essential that uh, we look at uh, the issue of uh, rebuilding banking in Europe uh, in the broader context of uh, the economic recovery which is uh, currently going on in, in Europe. Uh, and um, here there are some important issues uh, that we have to take into account. Of course, first, as uh, Anshu Chain said, uh, the existential threat uh, to the euro is, uh, is over. And uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, not uh, fewer members uh, in the eurozone, but we have more members uh, in the Eurozone as of uh, 1st of January this year as uh, Latvia joined uh, and we are now 18, 18 members uh, in, the, in the Eurozone. Overall, the economic uh, climate uh, in Europe uh, has uh, changed uh, in the past, uh, I would say, 18 months uh, to two years uh, quite significantly. And uh, in retrospect, I would say that uh, the year 2012 was uh, in many ways uh, a, a turning point. Uh, we had uh, First of all, an improved, uh, enhanced uh, credibility of uh, fiscal policy of the euro area member states. Uh, second, uh, the ECB took uh, decisive action with uh, its uh, LTROs and uh, the OMT decision. And uh, third, uh, we had uh, by then uh, reformed and uh, reinforced uh, the economic governance of uh, the European Union, especially of the Eurozone. All these factors together enhanced uh, stabilization and uh, last year we saw the start of the recovery and uh, this year our challenge is uh, indeed uh, to strengthen the economic recovery and in this context uh, the completion of uh, the financial repair is uh, indeed uh, an essential task. I might add that uh, one factor which uh, makes a difference between uh, the US and uh, Europe uh, is that uh, the United States uh, completed its uh, financial repair much earlier than Europe did uh, and uh, that is, uh, to my mind, uh, a critical reason why the, why the economic uh, recovery and growth is, uh, for the moment, uh, stronger in the US uh, than in, in Europe. Lord Tanner. Well, I think, as many of the other speakers have said, the story of the last two years has been a very significant uh, turnaround in the market perceptions of risk in uh, the European uh, banking uh, system, which you can see in CDS, in the funding cost of banks, uh, as Andrew says, in the cost of equity of banks, etc. And that is all a very good story. I think what is interesting is that that is not converting into increased levels of lending. We are still seeing uh, lending to the uh, business sector declining and lending to the uh, household mortgage sector uh, very low. Now, I think we've got to be careful of assuming that if we simply have one more heave and we have the asset quality review uh, and the stress test, that suddenly that will unleash uh, uh, more lending. Because I think we have to realise there's something going on on the demand for loans as well as the supply of loans. We've had this proposition for some time that if we just shift the banking system, uh, everything will be fine. I think it's very important to repair uh, the banking system. I think the AQR and the stress test are an important next step. But I'd just be wary of assuming that it's somehow going to magically unleash lending if that hasn't already been unleashed by the very significant falls in bank funding costs that have occurred. I think the other thing to say, however, is that the medium term is very important. Important steps have been taken on the banking union, starting really back uh, from the uh, finance minister's uh, conference, and I guess it was June uh, 2012 where the major statements were made. But I personally believe it will have to go deeper. I mean, I fundamentally believe that for the Eurozone to work, it has to go to a fairly deep level of federalization, which will require a treaty specific to the Eurozone. I'm slightly out of line with most British opinion on that. 
uh, and I think many of the steps that have been taken are the correct steps, but I think we'll have to go further in terms of uh, a mutualization of the guarantee scheme. I think if you think about how does a single banking market work in America, th there is no way uh, that it would make sense in America for an Illinois state bank to hold its liquid assets in an undiversified portfolio of Illinois state bonds and for its depositors to be dependent on an Illinois state deposit insurance company. If you said, that's how I'm going to organize the US banking system, people would think you're mad. Uh, that's how we organized the single uh, banking system within the Eurozone. So we've got more to go in terms of the reform there. Minister Schroeder, let me ask you uh, this question in a slightly different way. Do, do you have faith in the European banking sector at the moment. Opinion polls suggest that the public, the European public, doesn't have much faith in the European banking sector. But do you, the, the, the German government, do you have faith? I have faith in the European banking sector. I think we are the right way. It has been led by the European Commission much healthier than it used to be years ago. Always a, it's always a pleasure for me to listen to British speakers to tell the European we must uh, do the same as the United States of America. We are not. We are not. We are not the United States of America. We are not the United States of uh, Europe. We are the European Union. Quite complicated, but uh, it's an, it, we are rather successful. Now we, uh, of course, not all problems will lie on the banking sector, to be very frank. And we, we couldn't, we, we wouldn't have to uh, get so much success if we would only have relied on banking sector and monetary policy. Yeah. We have to solve the problems uh, by fiscal discipline and by, and, and by structural reforms. And we did it in all countries. And now we are building a banking union to, to, to get the same what we need. In, in, since Europe is totally different to other continents, <coughs> we are several nation states, very different remaining sovereign, sovereignty, and, and we have to find solutions for this. We do. And we will build this banking union. We have, we have a European banking supervision. It's uh, in the way to be constructed. We have president for this. We will have a vice president. We will have support. The, this bank, this uh, supervision will take, uh, in, it will take in office uh, in the last quarter of this year. We will have an asset quality review in, in, in the coming months. That will work. Then we will have a stress test. And then we have a European banking supervision by the ECB. And then we, we, have, an, we, have, an, 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 uh, we have rules for uh, uh, restructuring rules for all 28 European member states, because it's a matter of single market. Uh, we have it already done, it's a, 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 a bank resolution directive. We have uh, mechanisms for, we have harmonized rules for deposit scheme guarantees. And uh, we have, um, we have uh, agreed on a political way in the, in the European, uh, in the ECOFIN in December, late December, on um, a single resolution mechanism. That mm. has to be approved by European Parliament in the European way of legislation. That is always complicated, but we will get it, I'm quite sure. Minister Dijsselbloem, I haven't forgotten about you. I want to ask you about the, uh, the AQR, the Asset Quality Review, another lovely Eurozone acronym, uh, another one of, of many. Um, they're also known as stress tests, the European Central Bank's stress test to the common man. Uh, are you worried that they will unveil something rather unpleasant in the European banking sector? Uh, actually, uh, I rather hope that it's going to unveil some unpleasantness, because that would give me a good feeling that it's been done properly. And I think this is key. Um, we're not doing this to cover up and at the end of the day say, oh, everything's fine now. We're doing this to find out what problems remain and then to deal with them. Um, it's going to be a threefold process. First of all, we're going to look at where the risks are, uh, in what uh, portfolios of different banks. Then the asset quality review will do an in-depth uh, survey of those portfolios. And then on top of that, we will stress them, stress the banks uh, on the basis of also their context where necessary, etc. The ECB must be absolutely transparent on how they're going to do that. That's also part of the credibility of the process, and it has to be firm and tough. So the answer to your question is, yes, I hope that some uh, uh, bad news will come out of that, and that will give me a good feeling. Uh, we've done it properly this time. I, I picked up on one sentence you said there, we must stress the banks. 
I'm wondering whether or not that makes the banking executives on this panel sweat a little bit, whether, well, is that what you want to hear, Federico Ghezani? Well, I agree that uh, the stress test uh, and the asset quality review must be tough. And um, I agree that um, would not be acceptable by the market unless we have some uh, evidence of some problems to be addressed. <laughs> I hope that. So you two, you want the, the problem. you two want the AQR to find something that's <laughs> perhaps something. Your bank that, <laughs> no, really, um, there is a, still a clear lack of trust, uh, of partial trust from the market uh, versus uh, the European banking system. So this has to be dissipated thanks to this uh, exercise, and I think it's the last last uh, step before really we can claim to have a new uh, banking system ready to take the competition from uh, other banking systems. Because one of the problems, uh, and one of, one of the opportunities I see here is that uh, having uh, the banking union, having done uh, the asset quality uh, and the stress test, um, um, we can finally move uh, to the next challenges that are business challenges. So the European banks have to compete in the market, have to improve the service model to customers have to be uh, ready to uh, compete also globally. Um, Europe is becoming more and more an export-driven region, so we have to catch the business also outside uh, Europe. So let's do this last step. Has to be, as well, again, um, convincing, has to be tough, serious, done with homogeneous rules. This is indispensable in order to have a transparent process, and let's move on. This is what I hope. Uh, Lord Tanner, do you think the stress test will be credible? Well, I hope it will, and, and I think it will. Uh, I think we all recognize that uh, after the very significant success of the US stress tests in 2009, uh, we did a first round of stress tests. I'm now trying to remember it. I think it was probably 2010 when we, 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 we first did them. Yeah. And I remember going through the debates of that at the European Systemic Risk Board. And uh, there was a perception in the market that they weren't tough enough. Now, it has to say that one of the biggest problems we had at that stage was how were we going to treat sovereign debt? Uh, because the market was looking there saying, well, look, this sovereign debt is underwater. Uh, as Anshu said, you know, the CDS was suggesting a 40% or whatever it was uh, default uh, in Italy. But we had a position where it felt we couldn't possibly stress test uh, the sovereign debt. First of all, because uh, it was seen that that was a signal uh, of a lack of confidence. And secondly, actually, some banks would have been deeply underwater if we'd marked to market the sovereign debt at that stage. That was a very particular problem, which I think we are beyond. Uh, I think it's very important to have an appropriate treatment of, uh, of sovereign debt. But in relation to the rest of the portfolio, uh, I think it, it will be tough. The stress test element is crucial. I think sometimes people assume that you can do an asset quality review and it tells you definitively the quality of the loan portfolio. I mean, the, the crucial thing about banking is the quality of the loan portfolio keeps on changing with the economic environment. And that's why you have enough capital to deal with an environment which is inherently unknowable and uncertain. That's what bank capital uh, is, is, is there for. And that's why I think the stress test element is almost as important, indeed in a sense more important, uh, than the AQR. Andrew Jane, do you think that the, 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 the rules or the requirements set up by the European Central Bank, will, will they be clear? Will they be transparent? I suppose that's an issue for you. Well, first of all, let's not create this magic bullet panacea I totally agree with uh, Lord Turner. We're making things impossible for the ECB in terms of setting those expectations. Uh, the landscape is very complex. Uh, anytime you talk about the European banking uh, state of affairs, there were four questions. The feedback loop between sovereign bonds and bank health. Yep. Lord Turner talked about that. That's a condition precedent. And again, my compliments to the finance ministers and the powers that be. That issue isn't resolved, but it's been largely tackled. That was out of control for us. You've given us that gift. Thank you. Secondly, our capital, our leverage, our business models needed refinement. Uh, and again, as, uh, uh, the point that's been made, the US partially through the forced recapitalization, partially through a very different business environment, got to it sooner. Our good news is European banks are now right in the throes of it. And I agree with what Federico said earlier. Enormous progress has been made, and that's demonstrable. So those are two ticks, both of which are positive. Yet, interbank lending is not where it ought to be, even within Europe. And of course, the world's willingness to lend to European banks is also not back to where it used to be. That's where the stress test comes in and plays a very important role. There has been this slight miasma hanging over 
the European banking landscape that, oh, somehow uh, there's stuff happening in those balance sheets that we don't know much about. And I totally agree with the point which has been made by many of the speakers. I personally would much rather take the penalty of a, of a stiff stress test, which has been done to international standards, which A, makes banks in Spain comparable to banks in Italy, to banks in Germany. That'll be the first time that'll happen. And secondly, done to standards which are of international quality. So yes, it has an important role to play. And then the fourth and final piece which we haven't talked about is completing the regulatory process. So Europe has taken a bit longer there, candidly. Regulation was required. I, for one, believe that the regulation which has come has, has made our industry safer, fitter, better. But we do need to complete the process. The US now looks like it's, again, one step ahead in terms of there's greater certainty. We need that as well. Get those four things in place. We're in a good place. Let's not create unhealthy expectations for what just the AQR can do on its own. We will certainly come back to that re regulation point. But let me just ask also what will happen after the stress test. Uh, uh, and let me ask that to, to Minister Schäuble. The European Central Bank's president, Mario Draghi, he has said here in Davos that uh, banks that are found to be unsound should be uh, shut down. Do you agree with that? If we will have a European banking supervision and if, if, if we will have, uh, uh, since we will have restructuring rules and resolution mechanisms, of course this will happen. This would happen if it, if it is needed. That's quite clear. Do you Otherwise, expect it to happen? I think uh, finance minister must not speculate. It must, ma ma makes no sense. We do whatever, we, we are prepared, whatever will happen. We will, we have uh, a solution uh, with uh, this uh, fund which have to be built up uh, for uh, restructuring. That is clear, that has to be financed. That uh, in, the, in the interim time, until he, he is fully paid in, we have uh, already uh, have, uh, this, uh, agreed on a, on a solution for this, it's not, it's, as always in Europe, it's not uh, very easy, it's uh, complicated, but it will work. As always in Europe, it's complicated and it works nevertheless, and that is uh, the message. So. Okay, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, he said that the finance ministers shouldn't speculate. What about uh, European commissioners? What, what happens uh, if a bank fails the stress test? Should it be, be shut down? In fact, uh, I, can, I can concur with uh, the finance minister uh, with, uh, with Wolfgang Schäuble on, on this. Uh, neither should uh, the Euro European Commissioner, a European Commissioner, speculate. Uh, but uh, I would actually like to add that uh, we have now clear rules in place, uh, as uh, Wolfgang said, uh, and uh, we know that we know what will happen in case uh, there is uh, a bank uh, that uh, that fails uh, in the in the stress test, uh, and we have rules that uh, protect uh, European taxpayers. Uh, and uh, facilitate uh, an orderly bail-in of, uh, of a failing, failing bank. Uh, I think that's very important uh, to enhance uh, confidence into the, into the European economy. I would like to add to what uh, Lord Taylor sa Turner said about uh, the difference between the 2010 stress test uh, and uh, the current exercise. Uh, there's another very fundamental difference, uh, which is that uh, in uh, 2010, we had, uh, in fact, uh, the national supervisors uh, who did the test uh, and there was only a very loose uh, coordination of, uh, of this uh, exercise. That led to, I would say, perverse uh, incentives uh, so that uh, the national supervisors had an incentive to hide problems. Uh, and uh, that explains why, for instance, uh, Ireland uh, and uh, Spain did not uh, fail more banks, uh, which uh, only became revealed uh, later on. That was kind of uh, financial nationalism uh, in, in play at the time. Today, this year's exercise uh, will be led by the European Central Bank, uh, essentially its uh, supervising arm. And uh, now the incentive is uh, very clear for the, for the ECB Governing Council, for the ECB Executive Board, uh, for the supervisor, for Mario Draghi. It's essential that uh, once these banks uh, pass the entry exam to the Eurozone supervisor through the Asset Quality Review and Stress Test, uh, they are indeed uh, in, uh, in good order, and uh, Mar I'm sure that uh, Mario does not want to have a big chunk of uh, impaired, uh, impaired uh, uh, banks uh, in his uh, hands. I could use a worse word, but I, I don't want to use any, any improper sure, words here. I'm sure Mario doesn't. Uh, please remain in your seats, gentlemen, and the audience. We're going to take a short break now for programming reasons. Uh, we'll be right back uh, after this. Stay with us here at Fonsvankia. NFL football game. 
where you get timeouts, which are purely commercial timeouts. This will allow you to have a little bit of a breather, take a little sip of water, and we're going to set off basically in 30 seconds. Yes. Is the pace about what you want it to be? Yep. Yeah. We're, we're going to have to speed up a little bit. Well, now it's up to you. So if you mix it up. <laughs> we've had our turn opening up the heat. We've had our opening salvos. Can it immediately continue? <coughs> Uh, gen gentlemen, can I just ask you to take off your badges as well? Oh. Hmm. As if by magic, they'll be, they'll be gone after the advertising break. Never. I have you really are a fan of <laughs> continuity. Is, is really, it's really interesting. So IMDb, there's, there's a fabulous website if you're a movie buff. Called IMDb. So in IMDb, okay. they'll take great movies that are made, and then there is a lack of continuity, which is fascinating. The hand yeah. has shifted from the left like hand to the right. Of course, then you've got the ones where the mold shifts from the left to the right. And things like that. Yeah, really worry about that. Good. Let's get ready. Let's get set. Second, second, second part. <clears throat> Welcome back to Davos and to this special debate that we're bringing to you from the World Economic Forum here. We're currently debating Europe's banking sector, where it is and where it is heading. Uh, I want to turn to you, Lord Turner. Uh, how important do you think banking reform is for the Eurozone economy as a whole? Well, I think it is. Can I uh, first of all pick up, and then I'll transition into that, th this question of what happens after the stress test, because I think it, it, it illustrates the importance of banking reform. I mean, I, I take uh, Minister Schobler's uh, a, a, a comment earlier, we shouldn't assume that the US gets everything right or it's all transferable, but there are things to learn. And the crucial lesson uh, of the 2009 stress test in the US is that the US had a very clear answer to what was going to happen in the case of failure. And the answer was that if you failed the stress test, you were going to be told you had a certain number of months to raise the money privately, and if you couldn't raise the money privately, there would be a public uh, recapitalization. That's how the US uh, got going again with its banking system in 2009. And uh, going back to the 2010, I remember now that the other key problem we had in 2010 with the European stress test is we couldn't give the answer, well, what's going to happen if countries uh, fail? Now, I think the good news now is that the likelihood of failures of really large banks is much, much lower uh, than it was uh, before. But let's be clear, if we did get a failure of a really large bank, you can't simply say, I'm going to close it down. Because when you close down really large banks, you shock the real economy. So you've got to have an answer to the question, what happens if, despite all your measures, you have an undercapitalized, you know, really large bank? You want lots of equity, so that's unlikely. You want bailable inable debt, so that that's your next line of defense. But beyond that, you've got to be able to put in public capital. And that's the resolution fund. And I think the big danger for the Eurozone over the next 10 years is, until that fund is in place, we're still running a risk. If things went bad again, if the sovereign right. debt went back in the other direction, if we were back in a 2011 type situation, without the resolution fund uh, already in place, we would be taking very major risks. And that is one of the elements which is required for a working banking union. And until we're there, there is a risk in the Eurozone economy. Lord Tanner, you're obviously being quite provocative right? because I'm seeing That's the ministers and the, and the commissioner waving profusely here. Yep, right. um, <laughs> let's, sure. Let me ask Jaron Dijsselboom, what's your, what's your reaction to what you just had? Um, well, uh, the, 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 what Lord Turner is saying is that it's all very unclear, but it's not unclear. What we will do is, in main headlines, the same as what's been done in, in the States. Exactly. At the end of the process of the AQR and the stress says the banks will be given some time to go to markets, to restructure, in other words, to deal with their own problems. If they can't deal with that, I'm putting aside, of course, a category that simply isn't viable. Uh, and some of them will simply have to close down. Um, they will be given time to deal with their own problems, etc. Then they will come back to the governments and say, well, need, I need more money. Um, there is only one rule, really, and that is that the state aid rules will apply. So there will be a minimum required level of bail-in uh, to be put in place. One that, once that's been done, then government money can be put in. If governments are unable to do so because it's a very large bank or the government debt position is already critical, 
then the ESM can step in with a banking program or a direct recap of banks from the ESM. That instrument we will finalize in March, so that will also be available on strict conditions uh, on the outcome of the asset quality review, which is at the end of this year. Uh, and we will deal with all of these issues, uh, but the instruments are there. That's my main point. Including direct recapitalization from the ESM. Is, is that clearly agreed? We have agreed already in June uh, on the main headlines of that political agreement. We are now work, working on the guidelines, and we will come back to that uh, in March. That's my planning. will be on the agenda of the Eurogroup. It's been agreed that it's part of the package. No, no, It'll I mean, be a stri it's, it's, on strict conditionality. It was agreed back in June 2012, and then it's taken a long time to get there. No, but we actually, in June uh, 2013, reached quite a detailed agreement on what that would look like. And we're now putting that into guidelines. But no misunderstanding. These conditionalities are quite strict. One of them is that the deeper bail-in rules will be applied directly. Uh, the rules which are part of the BRRD will start, will be general practice as of 2016. But if before 2016 a bank uh, would apply for direct recap, there would be a deep bail-in uh, to be uh, uh, applied first. Uh, Andrew Jane, do, do you think that the rules of the European Banking Union and what you just heard there from Minister uh, Dijsselbloem, is that straightforward to you? Um, it is, and I think more importantly, actually, um, let's not forget, this is not going to be a digital event. Recovery resolution exercises have been carried on consistently now over the last couple of years, and that's the pace at which we will go. In the event, don't forget, every bank has been forced to stress test itself. Its national regulators have been, have been stress testing as well. So it's not as if we're starting from scratch. In the event, and this will only come about if there is a profound disagreement over valuation. So the way a bank has been valuing its own assets uh, in compliance with national regulators winds up being done very differently under the aegis of an ECB-sponsored stress rule. Okay? Now walk through it. You'll first go through recovery, then you go through resolution. And as we've said, in Europe, we finally have credible institutions, which we didn't have five or six years ago. And the ESM is definitely part of that. The only thing which we're saying, which is low turn of the difference between the US and Europe, uh, this will not be a pan-European response. It will be a national response. And we already don't forget, by addressing the sovereign debt problem, the issue about a country not being able to handle it, there are stress tests for national balance sheets as well. So I have confidence when you take all that together, we have what it takes. Wolfgang Schäuble, I want to ask you, is there a clear line of command in the European Banking Union as, as we look ahead? Is there a clear line of command? And when I say that, I mean the relationship between the national regulator and, and the European regulator and the European Central Bank. Is there that clear line of command in your view? That is, that is clear. There's a clear line, and, and I think it's, it will work. <coughs> of course... Um, there are some concerns, though, that there could be conflicts between national regulators it, look, and, and the European regulator. It's always the same. It, if, you, if you make something new, there are always a lot of concerns. And since it's always, it has to be a little bit complicated in Europe, because we are one currency, one, is one central bank, and uh, several uh, different nation states, member states. It makes link, things a little bit more difficult. Some doesn't like, don't like to join us. So you are invited, UK, uh, yeah, to, to, to join us. Policy, yeah. Yes, I know, <laughs> but, but we, it, it works, but in the beginning there are always concerns. Of course, it's, uh, we have always to have in mind that we, we, we avoid uh, disincentives. Therefore, we have to make clear who takes responsibility for what. As long as we don't have the, the restructuring uh, fund paid in, fully paid in, and we all agree on a, on a levy that has to be paid by a bank, but as long as it's, it's not, who can, who can uh, guarantee that the levy will, pay, will be paid by a bank? It's only the member state. Therefore, we cannot allow to, 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 to leave the, the member state aside as long as it is not paid in. That makes it a little bit complicated, but it will work, I bet it. It will work, it's decided, we have agreed on all instruments and it will work with some bail-in rules, uh, of course, uh, because everyone agrees it's not, uh, uh, not only the taxpayer takes the, the final risk, that's quite clear, but uh, it will work and uh, therefore if there is a need for additional capital, 
we have uh, solutions that this capital will be raised. Federico Gizzoni, you hear the message there that it will work. Do you think it will work? <laughs> well, I'm very happy to understand that uh, the finance minister are um, very, let's say, <coughs> committed to the point. So it would be really tragedy if um, instead of having um, one regulator, we would have uh, one more regulator. This would be... Do you think there's a clear risk of that? I think I agree. They believe that we will have one regulator, we will have uh, one resolution mechanism, and one day we will have one fund as well. Yeah. Obviously, it's a working in prog progress, but it's very important in this phase to have uh, the, 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 the way is, uh, is, is well defined, the way to get there, and it's very important to have uh, this a strong political agreement at European level. This is what makes the difference compared to, to the past. So I believe that soon we will have uh, the supervision, uh, we will have one regulator, uh, and the banking sector will benefit from all of this becoming, at the end, uh, more uh, uh, competitive and more uh, sound. Can I say something about the governance issue? Sure. There has been talks about, for one resolution decision, you would need 120 people and nine uh, uh, institutions to be involved. Uh, I would all invite you to, I mean, that's legal text, you don't want to read it, but you might want to look at it, and you'll see that there is I'll going to be... i tomorrow. There's going to be an executive uh, board uh, on the resolution authority with five independent members. They call in the national authorities, depending on what bank they're dealing with, and they will set a deadline. And if, if the deadline expires, then the five independent members can take the decision by simple majority. I mean, that's as basic as you can get. And only in big, big decisions where you need a lot of money out of the fund, then you need approval of the plenary session, the plenary board. It's not that complicated. Five independent members will, if necessary, within a set timeline, take a decision by simple majority. That's the way we're going to do it. Do you agree, Andrew Jane? I, is, is, is if it? I may add, there have been a discussion yes, on the involvement of the council. And I think it's, it's wrong. If, if, like uh, Dazelon just says, uh, if the board takes a decision, it's done. Of course, we have the Moroni uh, judgment in, in Europe that needs, that requests a decision by a European institution, which the council is, is the board is not. Therefore, we have uh, agreed on the solution. If commission does not agree, commission can ask the council for a decision. I bet this will never happen because the commission will always will always be involved in the decision of the exactly. board. And if the commission agrees, no one else is needed for a decision. Therefore, I want to, it will I want work. To, I want to pick up on a point uh, that uh, Federico Ghezzoni made before. He said that there needs to be clear political unity when it comes to the, to the banking union. Let me ask you, Wally Ren, there are concerns, there are rumours that perhaps the commission isn't on the same page as uh, the, the, the German finance minister in, in Germany when it comes to the banking union. Are there those uh, disagreements? In fact, uh, it's quite normal in the European Union decision making that uh, the Commission, uh, with its uh, right of initiative, uh, tries to achieve uh, a, say, first best solution for the whole Europe. Uh, while then, uh, during the process of uh, decision making, both in the Council with the Member States uh, and uh, in the Parliament, uh, there will be some uh, other concerns uh, at play. And uh, in the end of the day, we, we nevertheless uh, we get uh, decisions uh, and we stay united uh, be behind those decisions. Uh, and uh, they also become European law and we work according to, the, according to these uh, final decisions. As to this uh, question on uh, the single resolution mechanism and the resolution fund uh, and uh, the related uh, governance arrangements, uh, I believe that uh, the outcome is, uh, is uh, certainly defendable. It is uh, much less complex than uh, often portrayed uh, in the Anglo-American financial media. I agree with uh, Jeroen on this. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, it may be, may be still improved. Uh, and that's something that uh, in the coming uh, two months, uh, the Council and the Parliament uh, will need to look into it. Uh, but it's essential that uh, we conclude the legislative process uh, by the end of March uh, before the European Parliament uh, leaves for its uh, electoral recess. I just want to talk about the, the, the rescue fund as well. It's been criticised for being too small. 55 billion euros eventually in around about 10 years' time. Is it too small, Wolfgang Schreiber? 
we discussed for a long time, and uh, I was in, in I was one of was in favor of a, a, in a higher higher figure, and others were in, in favor of lower figures. But we have agreed on a, on a common solution, and uh, look, it's always everyone is uh, convinced that he has the best solution and the most pro-European. As member of German government, I always convince that government has the best opinion, and if parliament disagrees, we have to convince parliament. It's the same with commission. They are saying we have always the best solution, and uh, council and parliament have second best solution. That is the way of thinking of uh, governments and commissions, but it's not the way of thinking of democracy. We have find a common solution. But of course, in, in Europe, we are, we are bound to stay on the given treaty. So legal basis for all European institutions, parliament, commission, council, is the given treaty. The given treaty is not sufficient. In, 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 as as uh, the Attorney just said, we need treaty changes we, in some way. It's difficult to get. But as long as we don't get, we have to, 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 stick, to work on this basis, because it's the only basis. If you, if you, will, if you, will, if you will impose a, 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 leave, a bank levy, Amounting to 55 billion, it will be it will be a question by court, and if the legal basis is not sound, what will happen? We will we, it, in, in court it will it will be it will be uh, uh, destroyed, and that is not for the stability of financial markets. Therefore, we are in favor of a sound legal basis, in line with the complicated legal basis. That is exactly the problem we we had uh, tackled. We find a good solution, and I'm, I'm, still, I'm convinced it will work. OK, uh, time to, is running. You have to look at uh, the size of the resolution fund uh, also in the light of the new legislation on, uh, on the bank resolution and uh, recovery, which means that uh, there is uh, more rigorous uh, rules uh, for bail-in, which will reduce the need for bailout, uh, and uh, thus uh, it will uh, not uh, lead to such uh, great problems as regards but still to the size of the bank. Billion euros. Frank. I mean, the, 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 the Spanish banking bailout cost, uh, I believe, around about 40 billion euros, and that was just one country. Well, you have actually three lines of defense, and this uh, is related to what we discussed uh, earlier. You have uh, first uh, the private solutions, uh, so that uh, in case you need uh, to recapitalize, uh, you go for capital markets and uh, private investors. And the European banks have been doing that. Uh, in two years, uh, 80 billion euros uh, have been raised. Uh, new bank uh, capital by European banks. Uh, the second line of defense, uh, national resolution uh, funds or national, national backstops, uh, fiscal backstops, uh, based on uh, the state aid rules uh, so that uh, the equity share owners and uh, junior debt uh, holders uh, would be bailed in according to those rules. Uh, and uh, then third, uh, a European line of defense, uh, which uh, might in the near future be based on the Spanish model where the ESM played its, uh, played its role with uh, clear policy conditionality, which, by the way, succeeded. Uh, Spain left its uh, banking sector reform program last year. 41 billion euros were spent, uh, not 100 billion, which was uh, the maximum. And uh, now the Spanish banking sector is uh, clearly much more healthy and resilient uh, and able to do its uh, basic job. But OK, only, well, time is running away from us, unfortunately. We could add if European banks want to pay a higher levy we are ready to think about. That's right. All right, that, that's a good idea. <laughs> Maybe a gallop here. Two, two we're we're going to let the audience members in at this stage. Uh, uh, I'd like to sort of uh, bring in some questions from the audience. Uh, let me first turn to the lady in the second row. Uh, there we go, the lady in black. And um, please, once again, pl keep your questions to questions and yes. keep them brief. I have two questions. I'm Tonia Mastrobuoni for the Italian newspaper La Stampa. Uh, the first question is uh, on something that was said here in Davos yesterday by the French finance minister, Mr. Moscovici. He said that the bank resolution mechanism can be uh, improved. So uh, I wonder, I ask, I'm asking Mr. Scheuble, uh, which red lines are there for the Germans? Uh, because he seems to, 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 be, to agree with the, with the parliament that wants to change the, the, the mechanism <coughs> still. And the second question is uh, to Mr. Gizzoni. Um, yesterday, the governor of Bank of, it of Italy uh, said that the RQR and the stress test might, be, might um, um, lead the, the Italian banks to merger. And so I was wondering what you think about this. OK, let's start with the question to Wolfgang Schreiber. Look, there is nothing in the world which cannot be improved. Therefore, as always, I agree with Pierre Moscovici. Uh, we together found, with Jerome Deiselbaum, Pierre, and uh, 
Fabrizio Sacomani, we found a solution. We, 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 we agreed in, in December. Of course, now we are in, in, in trilogue with Parliament. I have discussed with members of the ECON in, on Monday, this week, also Monday, uh, to, to explain and to listen to their position, and there we will find a common solution. But once again, the, the, the limit is the given legal uh, basis. We cannot go beyond the given legal basis. That's the problem, and that makes it a little bit complicated. All right, the question to Federico Ghezzoni once again was whether or not the stress test will lead to uh, banking mergers in Italy. Yeah, very quickly, because the governor knows better than me. So uh, I think that, uh, um, yeah, some banks will have uh, the need to increase uh, capital overall, and they can do in two ways. One is to go directly to the market uh, or to find uh, alternative solution and merger is one. So I think that especially at the level of uh, mid-sized banks, this may happen. Okay, next question. Yes, gentleman at the front there. Hi, David Serra from Algebra's Investments. I'd like to ask a question to the bankers and to the finance minister. It's very easy for politicians to blame the problem six years after the financial crisis only on the bankers. The reality is one of the reasons why banks are not lending is because lots of businesses are not investing, and hence they're not asking loans, because the liquidity is there in BCB. ECB said, I have a trillion for everyone at 25 basis point. No one is borrowing. The reason is no entrepreneurs feel comfortable. And here's an issue of a politician not have addressed in many countries the supply side. So I'd like to understand from a commission of a politician which pressure you're putting, for example, on Italy and other countries, maybe France, which are not yet part of the uh, review process to improve the labor market reform, to make it more competitive. The second question on the banker side, assuming you pass the AQR, both of you here, next year, are you going to lend more money? Uh, do you believe your customer wants more money? Or in reality, you cannot because there is no good demand? OK, let's start with a question to Commissioner Rain, I believe. Uh, would you like to pick up on that? I can, uh, I can take, uh, take that question, certainly. Uh, as regards uh, Italy and uh, France, uh, both countries, uh, according to our analysis, uh, have lost uh, market share over the past 10-year uh, year period uh, gradually. And uh, there is uh, a clear need of, uh, of reform, uh, of uh, strengthening, improving competitiveness, uh, which requires uh, a reform of, uh, of uh, intensification of the reform of uh, the labor market, uh, and uh, which uh, also uh, calls for uh, the reduction of uh, unit uh, labor costs, uh, in fact, in, in both countries. Now, in France, uh, there are bold plans, uh, and uh, we are now waiting for these uh, plans to be concretized. Uh, that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to Italy using its, uh, uh, let's say, uh, recently, recently born uh, stronger political stability to launch uh, a bold uh, reform process, uh, which would include, uh, for instance, uh, privatization and uh, further improvements uh, in, the, in the labor market. So okay. I believe that, uh, in, fa in a way, Spain and uh, Ireland, uh, also Portugal, they have done a lot uh, to reform their labor markets, uh, their economic uh, structures. Uh, they have uh, regained uh, economic uh, competitiveness. Uh, they are seeing exports grow, and they are now seeing uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, now it's uh, the turn of uh, France and uh, Italy to follow suit and uh, take uh, determined action to, to reform their economies and, uh, and uh, economic structures. OK, the second question was an excellent one, whether or not uh or two, uh, the, the two bankers on the panel. Uh, let's turn to Anshu Jane when it comes to that one. If you do pass the stress test, do, do, do you think that uh, you'll step up lending? Or, and do you think that European banks overall will step up, step up lending to businesses? Tavari, I think your point applies to SMEs more than it does to blue chip. Is that right? Just want to make sure that's the case. Now, um, that being the case, I think we have to clarify that the status of SME, so I also agree with the point, and I think Adair made it earlier, that there's a demand side problem here as well. It's not just a supply side problem. Now, let's go country by country. Um, Germany is in a very fortunate position. The Mittelstand have come out of the crisis actually strengthened. They've done really well. And not just the demand, but the supply side's working really well as well. This is not the time for me to give bilateral uh, advertisements. You'll cut me short. But Deutsche Bank has been, and other German banks, have really stepped into the breach. And partly, the reason we, we have 5% unemployment and a strong growing economy is because 60 to 70 percent of job creation happens through SMEs who are both demanding and getting adequate credit in Germany. That's not the problem. The problem lies in the rest of Europe. 
And I will go back to my earlier four-point um, issue, which is a number of things have to exist, I dare say, for Italian Spanish SMEs to both demand and get the supply of credit, which they want. We haven't spent enough time on regulation. I think it's, imp it's important to note that issues like the definition of leverage ratios in Europe are still not clear. What do we, how do we consider a um, line of credit, um, the treatment of a revolver? Very fundamental questions are being debated, and I would just encourage. We've made great progress on the sovereign debt side. We understand the need for regulation. I will use this opportunity to ask for clarity and speed now, because once we have it, I'm confident, Davide, post the AQR, it's good business. SME lending is happening on good terms in most countries. It's technical factors which are constraining the supply. Yaron Dijsselboom, can I ask you to, to, to react to what you just had? No, I think it's uh, absolutely true that uh, part of the credit uh, drop also in my country was uh, supply and demand side. And I think uh, it's been a, quite a short drop. Uh, I hear now from my banks that the giving out credit to SMEs is picking up already. Uh, as the economy is picking up uh, immediately, also the quality of the demand for credit is uh, returning. And that allows banks also to give out new credit because uh, companies are repaying their loans. So the portfolio of uh, non-performing loans is also manageable, more, becoming more manageable. So it's, it's part of the uh, combination of getting the banks back into shape and the economy back into shape. And that, I think, will be very helpful in bringing uh, both demand and uh, supply side on credits uh, back together. OK, this uh, debate has passed very, very quickly indeed. I just want to ask you, gentlemen, for, for your final thoughts of what you think we should take away from, from this debate and this session here in Davos. If I may start with uh, Minister Schäuble there. I think uh, in all economic uh, discussions, we uh, must not rely too much on monetary policy because it's always a wrong incentive and, uh, and not to do what is needed, structural reforms. If we want to have sustainable growth, we have to fight for structural reforms again and again because the world is changing very fast. And by the way, if we want to work for sustainability, we have to work we have also to, to have in mind that we have to avoid too much inequality, otherwise we will fail. Because in this world of communication, everyone sees what, uh, in, 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 in former times, not everyone saw, and that makes uh, the sustainability of the, of, the, of the political framework much more fragile if we, if we fail. Lord Turner? Um, I think what we've learned from the last few years and from this uh, and reinforced by this debate is the reason why we had this extraordinary knock-on crisis in the eurozone in 2010 onwards after the 2008 financial crisis was essentially because of an incomplete currency union. Uh, we've woken up and realized that a currency union will among other things need a banking union. I think very significant progress has been made and let me be clear you know in my earlier assertions that it needs to go further. I'm not at all denying the very significant progress that has been made, but it, it is crucial. Um, this system of a single currency union uh, will not work with a fairly deep form of banking union. Uh, and my personal belief is it will have to go further still, and it probably will, because uh, I think this is, as uh, Wolfgang Schäuble has, uh, has stressed, this is, this is work in progress in an inherently complicated political environment. Uh, but I think one ought to be aware that, you know, by doing it without treaty change, a set of compromises have been made. And uh, life is not perfect, but it's, it's worthwhile keeping pointing out uh, that uh, we could do with getting a bit closer to perfection still. You're on dice, I think um, the lesson learned from the process of the banking union um, is that political urgency needs to be maintained. We've come from a situation out of the crisis where the sense of urgency was quite strong and we politicians were able to put the building blocks of the banking union in place in quite a short time. Uh, my main uh, ambition now is to keep that a sense of urgency in putting structural reforms in place, making sure that Europe becomes more competitive, and finalizing the financial sector on regulation, the asset quality review, etc. We're not done yet there, uh, but we need to keep that sense of urgency to push forward. We can't be complacent with a, a growth percentage of 1%. It's not enough, and we can do better. Oli Ren, very briefly for us. 
In fact, uh, I was listening to Tim Geithner, uh, the ex-Treasury Secretary of the United States, uh, the other night, and uh, Tim warned us uh, about uh, excessive, warned, warned against uh, excessive uh, uh, optimism. And uh, I think uh, Tim, who is uh, almost an honorary European because uh, he supported uh, our fight against uh, the Eurozone crisis uh, very determinedly over the last uh, couple of years, uh, may have taken the bad habit of uh, falling into excessive, bad European habit of uh, falling into excessive pessimism <laughs> instead. Uh, so um, I believe that uh, things are not uh, as, uh, they were not as bad as they looked uh, then uh, at the time, and they, were, they are not as uh, good as they might look for some people. So uh, we have to avoid uh, any complacency, and we have to stay the course of uh, economic reform both in the member states uh, to have more entrepreneurial dynamism in our economies uh, and uh, at the European level by completing the reform of uh, the economic and uh, monetary union. And finally, in the very short term, we have to really look, really look into the problem of uh, lending to SMEs, uh, especially in southern Europe, uh, which is uh, a very serious uh, bottleneck uh, to economic uh, growth, uh, because uh, economic history does not really know a situation where you have uh, economic growth uh, without uh, credit growth. All right. Uh, unfortunately, gentlemen, we have run out of time. I already have a producer shouting in my ear. Um, I want to thank you for being part of this uh, panel. It's been a pleasure to, to hear from you all. And I want to thank you in the audience as well for being here. Also, last but certainly not least, thank you to you at home for watching France 24. Do stay with us. <laughs>